Well, good morning, wonderful people of God, and welcome to our worship service. Um, we're going to open with a few moments of silence to uh, set aside all the craziness that we bring around us and inside us. Um, the centering prayer that we have for this morning is uh, meet us in our waiting as you breathe in and ever-present God as you breathe out. Meet us in our waiting, ever-present God. Feel free to use uh, those words or whatever words bring you into God's presence the most. Um, and we'll take just a few moments of silence. Please pray with me. Holy and gracious God, we come today as your children, as your people, as your beloveds. We come energized and we come tired. We come anxious and we come relaxed. We come hopeful and we come cynical. We come doubting and we come sure in a million other ways, from a million other places, with a million other emotions. Because you are a God bigger than all the things we're facing and you can handle them all, handle them all and more. And so we bring them into this time of worship. Thank you, God. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this place, all of our places. And thank you for this community. Amen. So friends, we've been talking about different types of prayer, uh, and up until this week, we've been using Gary Neal Hansen's book, Kneeling with Giants. Um, we finished with that book, and there are a couple other types of prayer that I want to talk to you about. Um, the one that we're going to talk about this week is about as different from what we talked about last week as you can possibly get. Uh, last week, we talked about the cloud of unknowing, and basically just sitting in God's presence quietly and trying to focus all of your love and attention on God constantly. Um, this week we're going to talk about praying in color, um, which is from the book of the same name, Praying in Color, by Sybil Macbeth. Um, she says, if you have things you want to say, go ahead and say them. Maybe even write them down. When the words run out, continue to draw and be quiet. Praying in color is a doodling, active kind of prayer. Let this time with God be ebb and flow between words and silence. And how we approach praying in color is quite different from how we approach other types of prayer. Um, one of the chapters in her book is called Praying Dilemmas. And she says, if any of these dilemmas describe your efforts at prayer, then you and I stand on some common shaky ground. Here's her, here's her list. If you make a list of people for whom you want to pray and then don't know what to pray for. If you can't sit still long enough to get past the Our Father or Hello God step. If your prayers feel more like a list for Santa Claus than a love letter to God. If you fumble for the right words and deem your effort hopeless. If you dump the contents of your heart and mind on God and then maybe wish you hadn't. If you turn to a prayer book or the Bible for solace and guidance and then fail to find the verse that describes your immediate need. If your, if your prayers feel too puny, too self-centered, too phony, or somehow just inadequate. If you're bored with the same old prayers that you've said since kindergarten. If you ask that God's will be done and then cross your fingers and hope that you can bear those results. If you promise to pray for others and then sometimes forget who they are. If you can't wait for your prayer time to be over and done with. If you start to pray and realize that you're instead thinking about paying the bills. If praying for others feels like checking off errands on a to-do list. 
if your spirit and body reach a place of calm and stillness in prayer, and then you fall asleep. If you would like, if you want to like the act of praying, but it is more often obligation and drudgery than joy. Or if you're sure that everyone you know is a better and more effective prayer than you are. If any of these sound like you, then praying in color might be something you want to try. The beauty of praying in color is that there's really no wrong way to do it. It really is doodling and praying at the same time. You can draw pictures, you can just mindlessly doodle squiggles and lines and circles and all of those things. You can write lots of words, or you can just write one word. You can take up a tiny amount of space on the paper, or you can take up the whole sheet. You can use a simple pencil or pen, or you can use an entire box of 150 different colors or more. You can use prayer requests, you can use scripture. The possibilities for prayer and connecting with God are endless. I wanted to share just a couple examples with you this morning. Um, if you're joining on Zoom, I'm going to screen share this. If you're joining on Facebook Live, uh, I put a couple of examples on our Facebook page images. So here are the examples. The first one is just the simple word God. And as you pray, as I prayed, I just sort of doodled around it with colors and squiggles and because sometimes this is what our life looks like and yet God is in the middle of it. And this is the other one. I know it might be a little bit hard to read because of the colors that I picked and the pens that I chose, but um, this was my prayer as uh, I was dealing with General Assembly the last couple of days, y'all. General Assembly is in the middle, and then some of my prayers for General Assembly are on the outside, the technology element that we're dealing with this year. Um, patience with each other and with the technology. Hope, which I know is really hard to read. Courage, guidance, and listening. There's no rhyme or reason to what these look like or why they look the way they do. They're just uh, the activity of praying in color. So I would encourage you to give it a try this week, especially if you're one of those people that um, praying and sitting still is just a really tough thing. I'd be happy to share my resources with you if that's something that you are interested in. So our scripture and our sermon this morning, friends, are coming from a guest uh, preacher, uh, Reverend Luke Roski Metcalf. He is a, a friend of mine, a teaching elder, pre, uh, Presbyterian teaching elder from up in the cities. Um, we've actually talked about Luke and his wife, Andrea, a couple of times before we started meeting online for COVID and after. Um, we used Andrea's words on Palm Sunday, um, her beautiful poem for remembering um, communion. And so I'm going to video share that with you as well. I will remember to turn Facebook Live around so we don't miss it. Um, Luke is going to give you an introduction and then he's going to read the scripture um, and then give his sermon this morning. So we will get that started. to do when I am up close and not far away from the sun. Let's make sure we can actually hear them though. Not hearing it. Hang on. Hang on. Technical difficulties, friends. There we go. Greetings to you. My name is Luke Roski Metcalf, and I am a Presbyterian pastor here in the Twin Cities area. 
My wife, Andrea, is an ELCA pastor. She and I served together through the ELCA Global Mission Unit as co-country coordinators for the Young Adults and Global Mission program in Nepal. We expected to depart for Nepal in February, along with our two daughters, but those plans were upended by visa delays and travel restrictions related to the pandemic. So here we are, still in Minnesota, navigating these strange times along with everyone else. It's a privilege to be with you today, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Today, I'd like to share with you a passage from Luke's Gospel that we usually hear during Holy Week. I find these days similar to Holy Week in that we may have more time to intentionally consider how we go about living and what it means to be in community. So here now is a reading from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Listen to the word of God. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see Jesus and see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be with the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, hear the good news. God is with you now in this very place at this very moment. More so, God knows who you are and to whom you belong. You are God's beloved. This may be difficult to believe as we live through these unusual times. These days we may feel actually more disconnected from one another or even from God. Remember, no matter how unusual this time is, God knows you, sees you, and has called you by name. Our gospel lesson today is full of themes and threads connected to important topics of the day, such as wealth, poverty, who are insiders, who are outsiders, repentance, and salvation. What caught my attention today, though, is Zacchaeus, up in that sycamore tree. I wonder what it must have been like for him to be perched up in those branches of that tree. I imagine him precariously balanced on a wobbly branch, just holding on and waiting. Today, as we live life in a pandemic, I can't help but imagine what time has felt like for you. Now, I know that for me, time has felt strange as we wait to move to, to Nepal. For some of us, time may have felt excruciatingly slow and drawn out because of the challenge of trying to work virtually from home and or maybe even teach your children on the side. Time may have also felt oh so slow because visits with friends or loved ones have been so far and few between, if they happen at all. Days may have become unexpectedly empty and full of questions because we find ourselves in the same boat as 40 million other people who are also out of work. Oddly enough, on the flip side, time may have also felt as if it's flown by, 
After all, how many of us can simply, how many of us simply shake our heads when we consider just how much life has changed in the past several months? Zacchaeus wasn't up in the tree for several months, but he was waiting. Zacchaeus knew that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He knew that he would pass through Jericho. He just didn't know quite when he'd get there. After all, it doesn't seem like Jesus is much in a rush. In the verses leading up to today's lesson, Jesus stops to teach his disciples about the challenges that are to come. He also stops to heal a blind man. Jesus may have stopped a few more times before passing that sycamore tree and looking up. For Zacchaeus, waiting in that tree, was time anything like what we've experienced over the last few months? Did the time drag out or fly by? Did his mind have time to wander or wonder or doubt? We don't really know. But the funny thing is about Zacchaeus climbing that tree is that he doesn't even necessarily want to be seen by Jesus. Zacchaeus doesn't cry out to Jesus for attention like the blind beggar or others who sought him out. He simply climbs the tree and waits to see the Messiah. I imagine that time slowed down for Zacchaeus as Jesus approached. I imagine a slow motion movie scene as Zacchaeus finally sees Jesus and Jesus looks up and their eyes meet. The scene snaps back to real time when Jesus says, Zacchaeus. Jesus sees him. He calls him by name and Zacchaeus's life is transformed. Friends, time is a funny thing these days. When time turns sideways, perhaps this passage can help us remind us, help us help remind us of who we are and to whom we belong. Jesus did as much when he saw Zacchaeus up in that tree and called his name. God has called you, friends, in Christ by name. Just like Zacchaeus, God knows you by name. Yes, we find ourselves navigating uncertain times as you live through these times, remember that God, God calls you by name and that you also belong to God. And for this, we give God thanks and praise. Amen. Amen indeed, friends. I am so grateful to Luke for sharing this story and those words with us. Friends, we come into our time of prayer this morning, and we want to continue to pray for Sandy and for Linda and for Karen. Uh, I did hear from Sandy this week, and she has a surgery scheduled for the middle of July, so we want to continue to lift her up in prayer. We want to continue to pray for Alyssa as she recovers with her knee and for Sean as he recovers from his brain tumor surgery. We want to continue to pray for Anna, for Annie's friend's daughter, Anna, uh, and this recurrence of her brain tumor, the treatments and the, the surgery that she has had. We want to continue to pray for Cole and for Brittany and their high-risk pregnancy. And we want to continue to pray for John, uh, for my friend Joe's dad. Um, he's had a pretty amazing and miraculous couple of weeks as far as healing goes. Um, in fact, they moved him out of the ICU yesterday. Um, so there is joy in those prayers, but there is also uh, continued prayers for his long road of recovery. We want to continue to pray for Cynthia's cousin Donna um, and her chemo treatments for lung and liver cancer and for Kenneth and Mardell Ruber as they continue to heal from their car accident a few weeks ago. 
Um, we want to lift up prayers for the 224th General Assembly. Uh, we were talking before worship started that our work started uh, Friday and Saturday of this, just this past week, but will continue Friday and Saturday of this next week. Uh, and there is a lot of work to do and a Zoom weird way in which to do it. Um, so I ask your prayers for uh, all of us who are involved with the work of the General Assembly this week, especially for our newly elected co-moderators, Alona Street Stewart and Gregory Bentley. Um, and this is new since I sent out the uh, worship right up this morning to those of you that got the, that got the email, but um, I'm also listing up prayers for our United Methodist brothers and sisters. Um, July, the beginning of July is kind of their moving time from appointment to appointment. So um, I know a lot of pastors who are leading worship with their congregation for the last time this morning and preparing to move to another place which is always a difficult thing, but is especially difficult in this weird time that we're in right now. Um, so let's lift them up in prayer as well. And of course it is indeed Father's Day. So we wanna lift up um, all those who have been fathers to us, um, whether by blood or by choice, uh, and the fathers that are in our lives. So friends, let us pray together. Eternal God, on this day, we lift up all fathers to you, recognizing that by your grace, fathering takes many forms. We lift up those who have experienced joy and fulfillment in fathering. We lift up those who have known the pain of a child's death. We lift up those who are facing fatherhood again or for the first time. We lift up those who have struggled with infertility and for whom this day represents a deep loss and a desperate ache. We lift up those who have such unbounded love that they father all of God's children, and those who father their children in their hearts, knowing that another family is loving and providing the best life for their child through adoption. We lift up those who lament their separation from their children for whatever reason, and those who, as foster or adoptive parents, create a safe space for a children fiercely seeking the love of a father figure. Likewise, God, we know the experiences of being fathered are many and varied. We lift up those who have cherished memories of being fathered. We lift up those who may have suffered abuse, neglect, or emotional harm from their fathers. We lift up those who remember with joy being fathered by a broader community of men and those who, are ex who have experienced or are in the midst of grief for the loss of a father or a father figure. We lift up those who were adopted into the loving arms of a father and those who may continue to experience estrangement from their father. We lift up those who have been raised by their fathers with deep abiding love and respect. And we lift up those who in the image of God the Father find faith and comfort. On this special day, God, we lift up all those who have touched our own lives with a fathering spirit and love in some way. Holy One who came as a child, we pray for your children everywhere. We pray for those who are hungry. We pray for nourishment. For those who are fleeing, we pray for safety. For those who are ill, we pray for healing, especially Sandy, Linda, Karen, Alyssa, Sean, Anna, Donna, Kenneth, Mardell, John, and all those dealing with the realities and repercussions of this pandemic. For those who are grieving, we pray for your peace, especially all of our United Methodist brothers and sisters in ministry who are leading their last worship in one congregation and preparing to move to another space of ministry this morning. For those who are suffering, we pray for your presence. Holy Three, the embodiment and epitome of community, we pray for communities everywhere. For those who are divided, we pray for unity. 
for those who are isolated, we pray for connection. For those who are afraid, we pray for your courage, especially for Cole and Brittany in the midst of this high-risk pregnancy. For those who are frustrated, we pray for new hope. We lift up special prayers for all those doing work connected to this General Assembly, the commissioners and the advisory delegates, the parliamentarians and the corresponding members, the technology team, especially the technology team, and all those in Baltimore who had already done so much preparation for an in-person GA. And we pray especially for our new co-moderators, Alona and Gregory. Be with all those involved in the work of the General Assembly this week, in our discussions and our deliberations, in our frustrations and in our impatience, in our internet connections and our technological capabilities, and in all those little ways that we need you. Holy One, bless us in the work of faith, that we might be truly faithful. Nourish us in the labor of love, that we might show your love. Keep our hope steadfast that we might know your grace and your peace as we wait for your coming reign of justice and overwhelming love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the hymn that I chose for this morning is one of those old faithful classics, Softly and Tenderly Jesus is Calling. There is a very calming, balm for the soul version that will pop up on Facebook in about 15, 20 minutes here. Um, so I invite you to listen to that this morning. And so, as you go into the world, whether that is just into your kitchen or out beyond your front door, Go with the assurance that no matter what is going on in the world around you or the world inside you, that God loves you. God delights in you. God is with you. God has named you and claimed you, not as sort of necessary or marginally useful, but as God's own very beloved child. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.